officially and let me officially welcome you to the vodcast this morning. My name is Gary Robinson and I'm delighted to be the chair for this uh, for this series of fascinating Saturday morning insights uh, into the world of connected baby, into the world of uh, attachment theory and everything that seems to go with it. So Suzanne, good morning uh, and it's great to see you again, uh, uh, joking apart. Attachment theory for parents is the title of this morning's vodcast it is uh, and I'm, I'm i'm really excited about this and i'll tell you for why we do this and we talk to a lot of professionals and practitioners who live in the same world as as as, as you i was going to say an i there but but i still come at this from a from a layman's point of view but i'm looking forward to this this morning because there may well be new parents or parents to be on this vodcast and attachment may be completely new to them so i'd like to start in a moment or two with the with the real basics uh, about attachment but before we do that Suzanne if that's okay with you uh, if I could say good morning to our guests uh, Stephanie uh, Beckman hello Stephanie good morning to you uh, it's good to see you um, how are you this morning I'm fine thank you uh, and you're here because you've been uh, involved with Connected Baby for a number of years now but you're also a proud mum of two yes so it will it'll be good to hear your uh, your background and how you have implemented attachment theory in uh, in in the in the bringing up if you like of your two wonderful children uh, Ethan who's eight and Sonia who's four we'll come back to you in just a moment Stephanie uh, and two guests who are no strangers to uh, this series uh, Cara Whelan and Michelle Jones Cara hello good morning to you uh, good morning, Gary. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you. And Cara, you are you and uh, Michelle run uh, Craig Miller Books for Babies, and we'll talk a little bit more about your organisation in a moment. And I love to see your love to see your teddy there at the back of you, just over your shoulder. Uh, does mm -hmm. does uh, your teddy have a name? Uh, that's Hamish Junior. Ah. Uh, and uh, Hamish uh, helps us with our with our baby and toddler rhyme times. Um, and he's been a, he's been around for uh, a long long time since the beginning of the project and he was named by children in the books for babies project many many moons uh, ago so um we do we do love our 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 teddies hey, hey miss junior what a great name uh, and michelle good morning to you it's good to see you again good morning gary lovely to see you and everybody else and and your teddy by the side of you uh, uh, has a name? Yes, well, he's Hamish Junior too, <laughs> 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 because um, we have Hamish in the library, and he's taking care of the library at the moment during lockdown. You know, so um, um. so Hamish, we've got Hamish Junior in mine, and Cara's got the other Hamish Junior, and uh, and they support us while we're delivering our books for babies, round times and story times from home just now. But I've also got, I've also got an elephant um, who is called Ernie and uh, he's very special to me because my son who um, is not home at the moment uh, gave him uh, to me for Mother's Day. So oh. he reminds me of my son who I miss very much. <laughs> And Stephanie has brought Paddington with her this morning. Stephanie, okay. do you want to tell folk why you brought Paddington? Um, Paddington is my four-year-old Teddy, and Paddington's been going everywhere with her in lockdown, and he's become extra special because Paddington has been sending her postcards from all sorts of different places. And even season broadcasters uh, do have their teddies as well so so we're, we're all we're all armed uh, with our wonderful uh, our wonderful teddies this morning that's great Suzanne let's come to you if I may and I'm going to put Dermot down there that's the name of my teddy um attachment attachment theory for for people who maybe haven't heard about it before what is attachment theory well the scientists call it theory but I actually don't use the term theory because I think it makes it sound scary for people. And although I can talk about the theory as a scientist, as a developmental psychologist, but the key message that I have tried to help the public to understand is that we come wired as human beings with this biological process, with this 
our bodies biologically are wired for connection and relationship. And babies are born expecting a relationship. Their brains are expecting it. Their bodies are needing it. And they only feel safe in relationship with other people. So in the presence of their parents. And, and if they're out of the presence of their parents or people they love, they feel scared. And it, that basic idea helps us to understand their behavior and helps us to understand how they grow up. It takes the confusingness out of behavior that a lot of parents feel. And so I just think everybody deserves to know this stuff that it needs to be out of the science realms so that we can make use of it and, and apply it and um, it makes our lives easier. And so when I put tigers and teddies, when I wrote the book and put that language to it, it was a way of trying to help these ideas to be accessible to the wider public, including parents. Uh, and this is Tigers and Teddies. This is the second edition of the book. And we can see uh, some of them, what, what, what are left, actually, because I, I know we've had a very successful run of these since we launched this a That's number of true. weeks ago. Um, but we can always print more. Um, so, so this is the book, and we'll talk about it in, in just a moment or two. And, and it's interesting that you move away, and you're a scientist yourself, but you move away from this word theory. And I suppose, yeah. I suppose in a way you've replaced it with that tigers and, and teddies type of language. Well, how, how, did, how did that come about and how did you, did you decide to do that? Well, tigers and teddies is really a metaphor for what our body feels like when we go into a place of fear, the saber tooth tiger system, or when we go into a place of comfort and relaxation and safety, the teddy bear system. And so our, our human stress systems go back and forth between those two states. Uh, and although we can make it more complex, keeping it simple gives people a starting place. And I wanted us to have a starting place so that people would understand it because we've had attachment theory for about 75 years now, ever since World War II. Indeed, that's how Paddington entered all our awareness. He came as a, um, as a child on the kinder transport. That's his history. And that's where attachment theory originates. But one of the interesting things and frustrating things for me is that, that science hasn't made it out to the wider public. So when I use the language of saber-toothed tigers and teddy bears, it makes it immediately understandable for people because you get the idea, wouldn't be good if a saber-toothed tiger were in the room with you, you would be scared. In fact, you might think you were gonna die. And that's what babies unconsciously are afraid of if they don't have a secure relationship with their caregivers. And it helps us also to think about how do I create more safety? So if one message that parents can take away is, when children's behavior gets frustrating and confusing and often what we see as negative, if we can help them to get back to their teddy bear state, it gives us a different way of understanding behavior and we don't jump into such sometimes punishment behavior that our culture has often taught us to do. If we have some, some parents watching this, and it will also be recorded for release later on, but they're watching this, and, you know, mum has a due date in, in a couple of months. Is there anything that, that, that before the baby is born, as parents, we can be doing, you know, prior to birth, as it were? Is there, are there practical things we should be doing? Absolutely. You can be singing to your baby. You can be laughing a lot. Babies know the voices of the people in their world before they're born. They can hear those voices through the womb, through the walls of the womb. Knowing that helps parents to think about the experience that their baby is having even before they're born. So if they will hear your voice and they will know whether your voice laughs and sings a lot or whether there's a lot of shouting and unhappiness in your family. And so part of the tricky bit of attachment work is to help parents to know how important and serious it is without getting without making people feel anxious or guilty so the positive way to put that is sing read books laugh as much as you can in those last few months of pregnancy 
and that's the um, emotional state that your baby will be born associating your voice with and that will already be wired into their brain and lots of people just don't know that when they're pregnant and i think it helps to make parents feel more excited to learn those kinds of scientific insights um cara if i could come to to you next um uh, what has been your history with the book or Sabretooth Tigers and Teddy Bears? Uh, this, is the, this is the second edition. But tell us about the history of the book and attachment theory from your point of view, Cara. Thanks, Gary. Well, in, in our project, in the uh, Craig Miller Books for Babies project, we have been um, using the Connected Baby uh, Sabretooth Tigers and Teddy Bears book for a number of years now. Um, and basically, we we see um, the work, Suzanne's work um, around attachment as being very much uh, linked and relevant to the work that we do with families. Um, we're, in, we're an early literacy project. We're part of a charity called Craig Miller Literacy Trust. And so a, a lot of our work is with families with very young um, babies and children. And so we have been, we have been using the Sabretooth Tiger Teddy Bears book in a, in a variety of ways. We've got a wonderful uh, session worker, Stacey, who's uh, joined us this morning. Um, hi, Stacey. And Stacey uh, works at the local baby clinic where she meets families every every week who are in for various health checks, um, getting baby weighed or um, meeting their health visitor for various checks. And uh, Stacey has been involved in gifting that book to families when they come in. And in recent times, uh, gifting it to um, mothers, mothers to be. So when when they when because the antenatal clinic happens to ha happen at the same time as the well baby clinic, so we have some uh, experience of giving the book um, to uh, to expectant mothers, and it is always very very well very well received. So we were quite familiar with the first edition of the book and now obviously with the second edition um, we were very very excited to see that uh, come out as well. And Michelle if I can come to you now um, if you don't mind what tangible results have you seen from parents what sort of feedback if any of you have you had while you've been sharing this wonderful book with the parents as as Cara's described? Deliver Raising Children with Confidence, which is an Edinburgh-run course that explores um, attachment. And uh, in one particular session, uh, we can get really, you know, involved in, in exploring it. And all the parents, it's it's like a kind of a light bulb goes off and they go, of course, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense that a baby is born looking for connection that they're ready and primed and it's it's as though they are the one that's calling on the parent rather than the other way around and it's about that dance of that relationship that parents think i totally understand that and that's exactly how i see it my relationship with my child and i didn't know that this was like a theory and that there was, you know, this cycle that you go round where a baby cries and then you go to your baby and then that, those um, kind of relationships have been built through those interactions. And really what it does is it gives parents fantastic confidence because they're going, okay, I go to my baby when they're crying and I look in my baby's eyes, I cuddle my baby. All those things are building my baby's brain. That's amazing. So it's, it's brilliant, you know, and um, it's not a theory to us either. You know, it's very important. That it's, it's a practice and it's real and it, you know, and it builds human connections and relationships. It's a bit like hunger, Gary. Mm -hmm. We don't need a theory of hunger to feed our children, even though there are theories of hunger and eating. So attachment is a bit like that for me. You can have a theory about it, and it started as a theory, but if you leave it only at the level of theory, it, it makes it sound like it's not really embedded biologically. So that's why, um, to back up what Michelle's just said, I, I often don't talk about the theory, I just talk about attachment, 
In the same way I would talk about hunger. Children need relationships, they need food, they need to be warm. Attachment is that basic a need as well. Stephanie, how has the book helped you and your parenting style? Um, so I came to Suzanne's work even before the book. Um, I was reflecting on the fact that um, when I was pregnant, I went to watch her films. I don't remember what month it was, Suzanne. I was very pregnant, though. Um, so I probably... Um, are maybe like some of the people here today who are thinking, oh, I'm expecting a baby and I'm hearing about this for the first time. And I thought the videos she had were absolutely brilliant. Um, and there was that video with the singing and the talking and, and what she's just said there. So um, I came to the book later on. Um, and by that time I was working in a nursery and I was around babies and parents all the time. Um, I'd had interactions with health visitors, you know, the people who visit you. And I had a very fussy baby, a baby that wouldn't sleep unless he was held. And I had quite an interesting health visitor who said, well, you're not going to be holding him for much longer. You can't always carry him to sleep, you know. And um, I think having this knowledge of attachment and knowing about brain development, because I was really keen for my baby to have a good start, as, as most people. And also coming to work in a nursery, um, let me see lots of other babies and lots of other parents and, and realize that everybody's anxieties are very, very similar. And Cara and Michelle probably have found this as well. And I do think the book is just a lovely way of explaining and giving people a bit more knowledge and a bit more, a bit more of a chance to think about you know, if people say these things, well, well, what do we feel is right for our own children? Because at the end of the day, they're your child and you know them. So it's just that hope that parents will, will be a bit more hungry for a bit more information, a bit, bit more about how to, to build up their children's resilience. Gary, Susan, can I come in there? Yeah, I was going um, to come to you on that. Um, I just want to back up what Stephanie just said there. Parents today are really hungry for information. And so there are lots of books that can, that can tell parents how to raise their children. But most of those are, tell you about parenting. I get nervous about a lot of those books, partly because I think what it does is it can make parents feel nervous, it can make them feel um, anxious, it can make them feel pressured. I prefer to talk about babies and the capacities that they bring and the needs that they bring. And although I am absolutely happy to, to talk about parenting in relation to that, what I want is for parents to feel confident in, in themselves. So what Stephanie just said, to know about your relationship with your baby, you know, none of the authors of the books are there at the time that you're having to make the choice and that the baby's crying and it's the middle of the night. So I want parents to feel confident about building a relationship with their baby and about their capacity to be a parent. And so that's why I talk about babies and that's why I uh, base it in the, in the process of attachment because I think that helps you to become more confident. And there is still a lot of debate about whether or not you should leave babies to cry, about controlled crying, which is what Stephanie just referred to there. It's one of the biggest debates within parenting. If you go to mom's net, it's one of the biggest discussions that's on the page. Our culture still often encourages distance between parents and babies. And then we now have a lot of science that says in many cases that can be harmful. And so it's scary to talk about that. How do we help people to be interested in the conversation rather than feeling judged and pressured? And so Stephanie's story speaks to that and it just helps us think more deeply. And I think that's more powerful coming from parents themselves, even than coming from me to speak to that, how attachment theory helps with that. Why, why do you think there is this, this block or there is some resistance to because when 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 you talk about attachment 
Um, and I'm very open about saying that I've, I, you know, I, I've never been a parent. Um, but, but what you talk about to me makes so much sense and so much common sense. But yet there seems to be resistance to, towards what you talk about and what you, um, uh, you know, what you write about. Why, why is that? I mean, it could be a controversial question, uh, I'm sure. But to me, it doesn't make sense. But so why is there resistance to in certain areas to this to to attachment well all cultures teach you how to relate to your baby and they teach you what to expect of relationships that's the key thing a culture does it teaches us how we should treat each other and covid has actually helped to highlight that it's helped it's helped to highlight the need for relationship because what's been hardest is being away from people you love and your friends and not being able to hug them. That's all about attachment. We come from a culture that values independence, that values distance in a sense, rather than closeness. We see dependence as a problem. And so we also have a behaviorist slant to our culture. We think you need to teach babies that stuff. So Stephanie's story, you need to teach your baby that, that she can't always have your attention. But it isn't a matter of just teaching babies. Babies come into the world hungry. You can't teach them not to be hungry, right? They, they, you might not feed them enough, but that means they will learn to cope with less food than they need. Attachment is the same. Babies come into the world needing relationships, needing cuddling, needing closeness. They have a biological need for that. And although they can survive without it, it doesn't mean that they will thrive without it. And our culture just has some very mixed feelings about this. We didn't always have this scientific knowledge either. There have been parenting experts that have encouraged distance and that still do. It comes a lot out of our cultural history. Now, let me also say, that doesn't mean that your baby needs you every single moment. That doesn't mean that your baby needs you to intrude on them all the time and to interrupt a lot of their independent play. But what it means is that babies don't need us to push them into that. They will want that independence. But if we tune into them, um, we'll get the cue of when they need that. And then we can support that distance as well. Attachment theory isn't just about closeness. It's also about distance. It's about babies trusting and therefore grown-ups trusting that love feels good in distance and in closeness, in happy times and sad times and frustrating times. What, what attachment helps us to understand is the importance of being with your baby and therefore with your child and with your partner because it stretches through the whole of life in whatever emotional state they're in. Stephanie, if I could come back to you, there's lots of information for parents, new parents, um, whether they have a, a partner or they're not, or bringing up baby by themselves. Um, when you were faced with all this information and various options, if you like, in terms of parenting and advice, and was there a, were you overwhelmed at any point in terms of when you were a, 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 a a uh, first time parent was there, there was there a feeling of being overwhelmed with all the information that was available to you and conflicting information sometimes yeah I would think I was definitely overwhelmed um and I remember I had a lot of help and support and you think about those times as an early parent you know um I needed a lot of support with breastfeeding and thankfully at that time Dundee had an excellent program to help mothers with those difficulties um I went to lots of toddler groups and met other mums and and talked to people there and sometimes it was just talking to people who had been grannies or had been parents before um i ended up friends with someone that i think is a is an absolutely brilliant mum and she is a mum of five she had twins at her fourth pregnancy and she was just the most relaxed person when i first met her she was trying to get twins up the stairs to this toddler group. And she just said, oh, it's fine. We'll just leave one of them here and I'll just run up the stairs and I'll come back again. And they, they know what to expect, you know. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that as you go through life, you, you realize that 
you, you can't rely on books. You need a support network as well. And I've recently relocated in the last year away from Dundee. And that's made me realize that um, how much of a support network I did have and how important it is for me now to build up that support network. And I think what Suzanne was talking about with all these pressures for parents to, to um, not co-sleep, to, to sleep train and all this, a lot of that comes from the fact that um, a lot more families um, live far apart from their relatives. You know, it does take a village to raise a child and the more people there are in the house to love and hold the baby, the better, the better it is for the baby and the, the mum's more relaxed. You know, those first few months that I had my mum before she left and went back to where she lives were great. Or they were stressful, but you know, you had that extra pair of hands. And so I think a lot of parents, the, the fatigue, you know, nothing can prepare you for that. Um, if you have a baby for you who sleeps, that's great. I had two that never did. So um, you have to figure out what works for you and, and, and read things with a little bit of that thing in the back of your mind. Well, well, where are we going with this and, and how does that relate to me? Uh, Michelle, based on, on Stephanie's comments there, um, come back to me. I mean, you, you work in the world of books you know, quite clearly. Um, how, how do your books um, complement parenting? Oh, we've got your we've got your mute, Michelle. The computer told me they kind of. That's perfect. Um, uh, part of what we do is deliver family support at home program, and um, and when I go into families' homes, it's very much about building a relationship with the family, and um, I find it uh, it's really interesting because I know we are an early literacy project. And, um, and we use books, but really books are just a tool, you know, it's about connections, it's about relationships, it's about relationships that we build with the families in the community, and it's the relationships that families have with other families in the community, like uh, Stephanie was saying about having you know, that network, and also relationships within the home, and, uh, and you know, books and rhymes and songs are such a brilliant way of carrying those messages so I can um, go into a family home and model book sharing and, um, and rhymes and songs and, uh, and talk to families about all the amazing information that we've learned from Suzanne through her work which is that cuddling a baby releases a hormone called oxytocin and that hormone makes you feel good it's a cuddle chemical it's called you know and uh, and for families to understand it they're making these remarkable differences to their baby with cuddling and i think it's really important that we remember that parents um they they do all these things and I go into families homes and maybe they're feeling as though oh we're not getting it right and um, if only you know I, I could do this or that and I, I go in and I go you know what you know what you're doing it's really good and I go in and I, I support them to identify what they are doing and them um, and build from there and I think that that is so important as well and um, just for a relational approach um, I don't go in and tell families what they should be doing I see what they are doing that's really brilliant and build from there and I think that to build trust to build relationships you have to get to know somebody first and when you get to know somebody that's when you know what they're doing and that's where we can um, build all these um, connections, you know, but, it, but you have to, you know, as a professional, you have to like, you know, you have to be authentic as well. Can't go in thinking I've got a tick box list and, you know, I need to talk about, you know, opening a book or doing a rhyme or doing this. You just go in with no agenda, each family's individual. And I think that's really important about attachment as well. To remember that everybody, is different. Can you show me your cuddle chemical, please? Uh, just oh, over yes. your shoulder um, there. So, um, I've got a few. Um, uh, for those who follow me on Twitter, um, I've been uh, on a really amazing journey for the past few years, and it's you know it's 
very, very largely down to Suzanne and her work, um, I was able to identify that the adverse childhood experiences I had um, as a child and the insecure attachment I had as a child resulted in um, certain choices I made growing up. And uh, so I've learned an awful lot and, um, and part of that has been to identify how I can do self-care and uh, I've, so I've been on a journey of self-care and, uh, and to um, celebrate that uh, I bought myself an a oxytocin necklace just to remember that really Ultimately, that attachment starts with yourself, and uh, it's about me getting to know myself and caring about myself. And also, I think what's really important about um, Suzanne's book is she talks about healing with the right people around you. And uh, yeah, my husband's the right person because he gave me that as a really lovely surprise Christmas present. He created the oxytocin chemical. And then with Suzanne this week was celebrating nine years in Connected Baby and her poster had the oxytocin chemical and I was like, oh my goodness, fate um, or what? So um, it's a remarkable thing because for me growing up, cuddles weren't a good thing. So I've had to learn um, by getting the right people around me. And, uh, and I think that in Suzanne's tiger, um, Save Two Tigers and Teddy Bears, where she explores about hope and joy and having those relationships, it just, I mean, it's its what it's all about, really. So, um, so yeah, it's been, uh, so that book for me is really, uh, it, it covers an awful lot of ground, <laughs> personally and professionally. Uh. Suzanne, Gary. isn't that a wonderful story? And I'm loving, I'm loving the language that we're using this morning, uh, which is non-scientific. I mean, how wonderful, the cuddle chemical. I mean, come on, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? <laughs> it doesn't get better than that for me because it means that we're finding ways to help the public to know this stuff. And I call it stuff often in order to try to bring down the scary feelings that science often raises for people. So to pick up on several lovely themes of all the brilliant things that my guests have said this morning. Um, for anybody who doesn't know my backstory, I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm an academic. I was at the University of Dundee for nearly 20 years in the psychology department and just got increasingly frustrated that I had access to science that I thought the rest of the world deserved to know. And I couldn't find a way to do that from within an academic institution. So I stepped away from that full time and, and set up this. And Michelle, I had actually forgotten this morning. Um, it's true, this week marks nine years from the moment that I stepped, that I did that. We held a big launch event for that. It had lots of balloons on it. Um, and it's true that oxytocin was on the invite that I sent out to everybody. Uh, and the, okay, so the idea that Michelle, who comes from a background of trauma, has been able to help herself heal in midlife is a story of hope. So Michelle is insecurely attached and she's not ashamed of that. I think that's brilliant. And she is so not ashamed of that that she owns it with a necklace that she wears all the time. Whenever ever I see Michelle, she has that necklace on. Am I right, Michelle? You always wear that necklace. And so for Michelle, it's a, it's a symbol of her healing and of her ability to love herself and to now trust her husband, to trust in relationships. Trust is being built into baby's biology by the time the one-year-old, a baby has learned whether a parent is trustworthy that's scary for parents to hear. In other words, will you be with me when I'm happy in the same way that you'll be with me when I'm frustrating for you and tiring for you and, um, and I'm overwhelmed myself? Will you be with me? And if a baby learns that you are, then they build trust into their brain and their body and then their body functions differently. We didn't always used to know this, but now that we do, the question is, how do you reach the public with that information? So another thing behind Michelle is the book, Why Love Matters. That was a bestseller from Routledge in 2005. It's about the development of babies' brains. And Michelle, if you just wave, if you say something for a minute, it'll come back to you if people can't see you. Just 
Okay. okay. So Michelle's got the book held up there. Um, so a woman named Sue Gerhardt wrote a book about baby's brain development with the word love in the title. Routledge is an academic publisher. They're not Simon & Schuster. And they were overwhelmed by the interest in that book. So it's an example. And, and that book, Why Love Matters, is you know, referenced in the resources section of mine. Um, so lots of people want to know this, but that book was full of a lot of, still a lot of scientific terms. And so I have tried to write a book that is really thin. Michelle and Cara tell me that they carry it in their bag so that they can pull it out when they might need it, which makes this information accessible to people. And let me say one more thing, because Michelle is here. She's used the word adverse childhood experiences. Um, Cara is you know, part of Craig Miller Books for Babies that tries to get this out. Stephanie has talked about um, just how confusing it is to raise a baby under what I'm going to call ordinary circumstances. How much harder is it to raise it where there is um, trauma going on? So I want to bring an edgy element to this conversation because I like doing that. Anybody who follows me will know that. Um, Michelle was with me at workshops that we did on adverse childhood experiences a few years ago. Here's the irony that I got up to, uh, thought about last night, and it was the first thing I thought about this morning. The hotel where we held those workshops about how to create closer relationships about adverse childhood experiences, that hotel is where the stabbing occurred yesterday in Glasgow, and, some, and the perpetrator died, okay? the first thing I thought about was, I wonder what trauma was happening for the asylum seekers housed in that hotel. So lots of people will have thought about the violence that have happened, and that's important, but I found myself thinking about the trauma. And I wanted to bring that in this morning because I knew Michelle would be here. I feel really connected to that hotel this morning because trauma happened. Trauma happened in the lives of those asylum seekers, or they wouldn't be asylum seekers. And there's something about needing to hold both the scary bit and the hopeful bit that helps us to take attachment really, really importantly. There are people in the, in the chat that are saying, um, why isn't this book in the baby box? We get that a lot. Michelle and Cara might want to speak to that. That's one way we could have this information reach people. It makes me wonder, what are all the ways that we can help this information to get out to people? And I know I've just said a lot there, but it, I think that hints at how rich an understanding of attachment is and all the different places that it goes. And that's why if we can just keep talking about it as a culture, more and more people, business, social work, teaching, politicians, manufacturers of baby buggies, police, all of those people will understand that this stuff is relevant to them. Cara, if, if I can come to you for, for just a moment, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, for those people who aren't with us from Scotland, um, we talked about baby boxes, and baby boxes are something that the government give to new parents. So it's almost like a kit box, isn't it, that is provided uh, to new parents in Scotland. Um, why, Cara, do you think the, the book, this book, should be in every box that goes out there from here on in? Um, well, the, it, it would just be such a, a wonderful opportunity to disseminate the, the wonderful information and knowledge that is, that, that is in the book to a much, much wider uh, group of people. And it would send out a very, very clear message um as well that this is something that is really valuable to know and really important um to to know about because from from the discussions that we've had this morning the the cultural element is absolutely key to this and one of the things that that we know from our experience of delivering um the books for babies project is you know we've been on, we've been on the go for 20 years and when, when our project first started, there, wa there was an element of uncertainty around um, sharing books with babies. You know, why, why would you do that? Why would you share a book with a, with a newborn <laughs> baby, for example? Um, and then fast forward 
a number of years later, there's now uh, there there was an expectation that parents would receive a book for their baby when their baby was ten days old, and it's creating that expectation that where is where we start to see the shift in culture, because if more parents um, have access to this information and they learn about attachment in relation to their own relationship with their children, but also the relationship with those around them, but also their relationship with themselves, then they start to look a little bit further afield and start to look, ask the question of others around them. Are you know, are you working in an attachment led approach? If I send my child to this nursery, is that nursery, you know, working in an attachment led or relationship based approach? And I think that's where we get um, that's where we get the, the, the shift in, in culture, because we create an expectation that attachment led practice is something that that is um, not only spoken about, but actually but actually practiced. So it would be hugely beneficial for um, for Scotland as a as a as a country uh, to have this information more widely available and a and a, and a universal um, program um, is something uh, that is you know really I mean it's it's kind of obvious and I know that's obviously something that's that's been spoken about because it's obvious and I've seen lots of comments coming up this morning asking that question why is it not in the baby box so yeah that's what um we think that books for babies it, it definitely definitely should be definitely if i could come back to you um your your family is featured in the in the book it was in the first and the second edition i believe um how do you how do you feel about that about being uh, instrumental in the in the success of this book I am such a great supporter of Suzanne's work and I do think it's just so important and it's really nice that there are a variety of different photos captured um, and they're not all happy photos of my children. Um, and I, I think as a parent it's important to realise that you know you might capture the happiest moments but there are also lots of frustrating moments and lots of moments where your children are frustrated too. And I think for my children, it's going to be great when I can sit them down and talk to them about attachment and, and babies and, and let them see the book and say, look, you're in the book. Because I think I was speaking about this to Stan earlier about how important it is for them as um, children of mixed race to, to see themselves in things like books and, and realize that, you know, um, they can be represented as well. Suzanne, um, you, you touched on ACEs, on, on, on adverse childhood experiences uh, a little bit earlier on and the, the tragedy that happened in, in Glasgow yesterday. It's also interesting to think about um, trauma and not just trauma for the, for the people who experienced yesterday, but also it makes you wonder about the trauma that the perpetrator maybe had in in their lives uh and which can also be a difficult uh a difficult conversation to have um but do you think that if if is there a direct direct correlation do you think between um attachment and attachment theory and we're not using the word theory and and aces in the in the longer term see the, the reason why i ask i come from a generation where a good clout round the ear never did me any harm uh, and until I started working with you, I realized that it did. So, so is, there a, is there a direct correlation between, between what we're talking about today and, and ACEs? Yes, there is. I see ACEs, and for anybody who's new to this, that's Adverse Childhood Experiences, A-C-E-S. And there's a lot of people now in... Um, you know, kind of growing around the world who talk about the science of adverse childhood experience of ACEs. And Scotland has been a real leader in that. There's a big uh, movement. The public are interested in ACEs. I think ACEs is a direct um, extension of the work of John Bowlby, who uh, originated the study of attachment. So I think our understanding of the impact of 
difficult childhood experiences, lots of saber-toothed tiger moments, how that shapes your biology. I see ACEs as an extension of his work, but it isn't often how ACEs is talked about. So the scientists who are associated with it, um, Feliti and Anda, Nadine Burkaris, um, her book is also behind Michelle there. Um, when we use that language of ACEs, it often isn't linked to attachment which just tells us there's more to that conversation about ACEs than lots of people are having. And for me, they're directly linked, even if we don't talk about it that way. And if you get curious, we could talk about that in more depth. In this version of the book, I have a whole chapter on ACEs and relate it back to attachment. Um, some people in the chat have said, how does this differ from the first edition? Um, I, tell, I tell about ACEs. I tell stories of people who are using this information to make a difference to their personal lives and their professional lives so that people can see the difference that it makes. Um, and so here's one more example of how I think that's relevant. And I'm going to go back to edgy for a minute. There's a new book about to come out next month that is written by the niece of Donald Trump. And apparently she's going to tell us in that story of his childhood that is full of neglect and abuse and harm. I'm not surprised. I have thought that from the beginning, that there was a lot of that that will have gone on in his life. Now, I don't know him. You could say, well, is that appropriate for me to think about, given that I'm not there to diagnose him? I don't think this is about diagnosis. I think this is about understanding that if you don't have safety in your early childhood, it leaves an impact on your biology and your ability to have empathy and connection to other people. We need to take that seriously in our policies, in our culture, in the way we treat children as professionals working with children. We need to get this because if you don't and you grow up and you have unresolved trauma, then you're more likely to cause danger to other people. And I think that that's what's happening. And I'm happy to say that, and this will be broadcast. Donald Trump is causing harm and is dangerous for other people. And that is what we come to understand when we link attachment with trauma, with ACEs. We can think much more seriously about how we treat our young children. And one of the stories in the book is about how schools are changing their practice on the basis of that. And so it used to be that schools gave children a clout around the ear. We called it strapping. But until the 1980s, it was culturally and legal and culturally endorsed to hit children in school. There are tons of adults in our country who got hit at school. Now we're a bit uncomfortable about that idea. And if that kind of culture can change, can come about since the 1980s, now we don't find that acceptable in schools. I hope that can come about in wider culture as well, but it will only happen because we talk about it and we have celebratory stories like our guests today, which is why I'm so grateful that you three of you have been willing to come and talk about this. It's, it's almost like breaking the cycle. It is like breaking the cycle, but it's also like breaking the beliefs about what you do as a parent, about what you do as a professional, about how we treat our children. It's a cultural shift. And I know we've got people here from other cultures, from Australia, you know, from Northern Ireland, from the Netherlands, um, and perhaps beyond that I haven't even seen. Every single one of us can then think about what does our culture teach us about how to relate to children? And what does our class teach us? Last week in our series, we had a discussion about boarding school. And so that brings in a class belief about how you treat children, how you treat children, and how you think you're supposed to treat children shapes who they become. It's both fascinating and a bit anxious making. I want it to be anxious making enough for us to take it seriously and then get curious, not worried. That's what I want. I'm going to come back to Stephanie in just a second. I want to say something uh, to people who may be new to this, who are, who are viewing this for the first time, or the concept of, uh, of attachment is new. Uh, and I, I trust that we have a number of those people watching this. I do recommend that you follow uh, Connected Baby and Suzanne on social media, on Twitter in particular. I'll tell you why I say that is last night, I think it was, Suzanne, relating back to Donald Trump, you tweeted a very interesting piece around stress and Donald Trump and the more stressed 
that he becomes um, the 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 more sort of closed minded and he can't see the wood for the trees type of language. I know it's much deeper than that. The more stressed he becomes, the more erratic he will become, the more yeah. extreme. That's just that's just stress. But the, his stress really matters because he's making decisions that affect the whole of his country and the wider world. And so if he can't think well, then danger ripples out. And if he comes from a background of trauma and stress, as he clearly does, then his stress system doesn't function very well. And knowing that helps to make sense of behavior that is scary coming from a leader. Leaders who can self-regulate and who know themselves well enough to take care of themselves and to be empathic to others lead organizations and country in a way that is healthy for us. And it's interesting to think about how New Zealand coped with COVID compared to the way in which some other countries have. And that's an example of empathic leadership. That's a whole different episode. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so Stephanie, let me let me come to you. I've got a few final questions before we wrap up uh, uh, here. Um, have there been uh, any tangible results that you can share with us in terms of how you've taken the uh, the attachment approach with your children and and with you, with you as a parent? Um, I think. I, I try as much as I can and I think I'm like every parent sometimes your patience does wear thin especially in lockdown when you're homeschooling and doing everything else but I think I do try my best to um, think about what age and stage my child's at and, and, and how their reactions you know as they grow up what are our expectations of them as adults and you know try and res just be more responsive to, to what they're like and, and and sometimes my daughter, she comes up this week, she said, um, will the cat be okay when we go pick up Ethan? And I said, yeah, I think it'll be fine. Well, she knows that grown-ups come back, mummy. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, she does. She does know that. And so sometimes what your children say back to you um, really makes you realize what, what you're saying in, in um, I worked very closely with an educational psychologist in Dundee when I ran um, a nursery there and she talked a lot about scripts and as parents you develop your own scripts every day um, whether it's you know two more minutes before we need to get changed or three more minutes before we need to brush our teeth um, it's bedtime now what book would you like you know there's all these little things that you say and if you can start, I always say, um, I used to say to a lot of my parents that were worried about language development, and I always said, just talk to your baby. Just, just tell them what you're going to do. Just, and a lot of that, you know, if you, if you do that all the time, and I used to do that all the time, especially with my second one, because you're trying to get two children ready in the morning, and, and it was all a source of stress because you had one was going to school and one was going to nursery, and you're like, ah. And I think there are a lot of parents out there that can identify with that moment. Um, but if you have your scripts and what you're going to do and what you're going to say and you start when they're baby and you say okay now we're going to get changed and now we're going to put your arm here we're going to put your arm there um it helps calm you down as well that's what i always thought and and sometimes you know when you first start doing it, you think are people going to think i'm crazy i'm always talking to my baby and and i used to do it on the bus as well i used to sit on the bus in dundee and i just talked to my baby i go yeah and look at that and look at this and yeah yeah there's a little old lady there and she's just waving at you and um but it becomes part of your daily life and your children are all the better for it. Wonderful. Michelle, can I come to you please? And then Cara and one more question for you, Stephanie, before we wrap. Uh, Michelle, and it's actually the same question for all three of you and it's to do with the book. Um, one key insight that you believe that parents will take away from reading Sabretooth Tigers and Teddy Bears, The Connected Baby Guide to Attachment. So Michelle, if I can come to you first. Oh, it's such a hard question. There's so many things. Um, but I think that uh, what's really fascinating and important is um, that babies are uh, totally amazing and they're active participants, you know, um, from birth. They're, they're, they're just there waiting to, you know, engage and, um, and you know, when you know, I've, over the years, you know, 
people, why are you teaching babies to read? Do you know what I mean? They're too young or they're this or that. And it's all about what Stephanie's saying about that, what we call in Craig Miller Books for Babies from the Harvard um, uh, work that's been done is Serve and Return. So it's about that dance of um, to and fro that builds those connections, can build language, that fundamentally builds trust, you know, and I think for uh, that's what um, this book really helps with, is to understand all those things that are being uh, helped by um, doing all that as a, as a parent, but also, you know, when we're older, because I see, um, see a bit of Tiger and Teddy Bears very much in, as for adults too, you know, about, we, we look to each other, I think, is it Philippa Perry that calls it like bids for attention? It's basically like serve and return. You look to someone with eye contact or with your body language, a lot of work we do is very much about you know babies before they're speaking, non-verbal communication. So it's about that reciprocal nature of um, response. So I think that there's so much in the book, you know, but that's probably my main thing from it is how amazing babies are. <laughs> that's, that, Michelle, that's a great answer. You've probably answered for everybody, but I'm still going to ask the same question to Cara. Uh, and thank you for that, Michelle. So Cara, for you, one key insight for, for parents, what you think they would take away from reading the book? Um, I think the, like Michelle, there's so much in the book. Um, there's so many key insights, but I think understanding um, that our, that attachment and um, is linked to our biology. I think that's a really, really key insight. So the whole, you know, from, parents have given such positive feedback to us over the years, particularly around understanding just what, um, how what they're, they're doing is helping shape their baby's brains, the whole neuroscience, but also understanding uh, biologically what is happening um, to, you know, when, when a baby cries, that they're actually, you know, they're, they're, meant, they're meant to do that, that's normal, um, that's how they communicate and understanding why that's you know why why that's important and understanding it from a biological point of view throughout our whole lives because i agree with michelle this is information for everybody and it's information for uh, to help us understand babies and children but also to help us understand ourselves as um as adults and you know the the environment that we find ourselves in there's a lot there's a lot of hostility towards uh, parents and towards young children and parents are already feeling under pressure and under stress you know if, if their baby cries and they have to get off the bus or they have to you know provide feel that they have to provide um earplugs for pass for fellow passengers on, on on planes or if they come into a public space and their child is running around and they're only two years of age and that's how they explore that space and they're getting you know uh, criticism or or, or or dirty looks. There's you know there's a there's a hostile environment out there for for parents, um, and it doesn't get any easier as children get older. Uh, we have the whole culture around you know blame the parents, where are the parents, how can parents let this happen? So I think this book actually um, gives a lot of reassurance to parents um, that actually were you know biologically we are on a journey from birth right through our right through our adult our, our to adulthood and i think if if those around parents and families understand this as well then that would actually you know that would be a, a good thing too so it's not just for parents and carers um of young children but for for all of us in in society and Stephanie, uh, as our guest as well, uh, final word to you about a key takeaway from the book uh, that you believe that parents will will uh, will benefit from. Um, I'm going to relate mine to lockdown and transition. Um, I feel like having um, a really good understanding of attachment and and really responding to your baby, responding to your young child or your older child is really important in times like this. I feel like I've gone back to a lot of my attachment training and, and all this um, in recent months because there has been so much change and easing of restrictions is different in different regions and countries, but you know, everybody 
is at a different pace. We talked about this at work this week. Everybody psychologically is going to be at a different place, whether they want to go to the beach or whether they feel that comfortable having um, someone round to, to be in their garden for a cup of tea. Um, I feel as a parent, I'm really um, fearful of having um, social interaction because children don't understand social distancing. And so can I have my four-year-old have another four-year-old play with another one? Um, my children now have gone to the childminder because childminders in England are open for the last three weeks. And the first thing that my daughter asked is, can I, can I play with you know, my friend at, 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 at the childminder? Do I have to social distance mummy? The children have learnt all the language of lockdown. We need to help them create new language for coming out of it. Um, and parents have such an important role in that, in staying calm despite all the stresses. And if, the, if you can read this book and, and it can help you ground kind of yourself and what you can do during this difficult time, I think that's what I'd like to give to some of these families. Wonderful, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Suzanne, there we go from, um, from our guests in terms of uh, what they believe that parents will get from the book. You're the author. Um, what are they going to get? Uh, can I just say it is astounding to me just to have heard all of that. Um, I never know quite what people are going to take from the book. Uh, knowing that it is helpful is, um, is what helps me to think more creatively and deeper. So to, to hear what is in the book is better to come from my guests than to come from me. Um, I want to add one more thing to everything that everybody has said, because it's the one thing that I think we didn't highlight yet today, and that is that you do not have to be perfect. Okay, so in, attachment information does not up the ante for you. I hope it helps you to relax. It, it tells us that you you just have to be a good enough parent. You just have to tune in enough. You just have to be able to say sorry when it doesn't go right rather than judge yourself. And then indeed, we'll, we'll talk about that rupture repair cycle later in the series. But for right now, because I've been seeing lots of things come up on the chat, I just want to emphasize, um, you, you do not have to have been a perfect parent. Um, we've got one parent coming up saying that when they learned about this, they cried. And then they learned to forgive themselves for what they didn't know so that they could tune in and become more responsive to their child now, which I think backs up everything everybody said. And it has been delightful to hear your guys' view on this. So thank you for being here. And the book is in uh, various formats, um, but if you want to order it, connect to Baby website, first place to go. From the resources page, and we'll ship it right out to you. It's, and lots of people have been sending us pictures of their book arriving. If you choose to do that, we will love that. If you choose to tweet us pictures this morning of you with your teddy, we'll love that as well. The key, if, if we can make this feel accessible and real, we'll, you'll have got the idea that that's my goal. And that's why the, the book is full of pictures of real people. It's got a dad on the front to say, this is not just about moms. This is about all of us. It's got grown up people on the back. Is trying to say this is about the human experience and these are real people it's not a fancy theory up there and thank you for all your help and helping me talk about that gary well we're back on the 11th of july saturday morning the 11th of july at 10 30 uh, gmt uh, with dr uh, jess taylor we'll be talking about getting rid of jargon it's going to be an interesting debate. Uh, Dr. Jess Taylor doesn't hold back. She's very forthright, uh, as are you, Suzanne. So I don't know whether I'm going to be the chair or referee on this one. Um, so it will be interesting, but book your place as soon as the link comes out, because there'll be lots and lots and lots that come out of that discussion. Uh, fireworks and uh, some excitement, I'm sure. Uh, to our guests, to Cara, to Michelle and to Stephanie, Thank you very much indeed for being with us this morning. We very much appreciate it. Certainly uh, the viewers from around the globe have certainly appreciated it. I've seen, I'm seeing a lots and lots of chat. Uh, and Suzanne, to you, I will see you in two weeks and we'll do it all over again. Brilliant. Thank you for coming, everyone, to the three of you and to everyone who joined us. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful week. 